sound. Uh, Razvan, you can hear me? Yeah, sorry. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. So can, can you hear me clearly? Uh, okay, and so now you can share your screen. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, first introduce NXP, who we are, what we do for those that are not familiar with it. So we are a semiconductor company and we have been here since really the beginning of the semiconductor industry. We have a history of more than 60 years of uh, both semiconductor designing and manufacturing. And we spend a lot of time continuing to, let's say, improve our products in all possible areas. Um, as for some numbers, we have employees in over 30 countries. So if it's of any interest, you can check if we're present in your country. Um, as for other information, we have around 11K engineers and we are going towards 10K patent families. So that's a lot. Um, yeah, but let's switch from the pure data and move forward to, to see what we actually do. And here, if you take a look at, let's say today's tech tree or whatever you wanna call it, we have in the middle the cloud. So this is something that everybody uses it, everybody knows what it is and roughly how it works and even why it was born in the first place. So we have, <clears throat> uh, we have the, the large processing power, we have the data centers and these are in the millions. We have some huge memory and power consumption. And then we have what we call the edge. And this is the place where we have the, the billions of end devices connected uh, and devices that uh, make our lives easier and hopefully maybe our planet a little bit better. And I'm talking here about all devices that really make our lives as we know it today. So having you know the, the smartphones being connected at any time, um, having this impressive infrastructure that lets us, uh, let's say forever scroll our Facebook, Instagram, or whatever Reddit feeds we are scrolling, uh, even lets us turn on remotely uh, the air conditioning, maybe 15 minutes before we arrive at home and many other gadgets like this. Um, moving a, a bit forward, we have everything that is grouped under this umbrella term of smart city. And to put it simply, it's everything that really simplifies how, let's say people interact with different services. And it can range from uh, just being able to, to get some data, let's say about the air quality for your location, just to, to be sure you're still living in that lovely place where the air is always polluted. Um, and can go to, to anything else like showing you on a map where the nearest free parking spot is. Um, we also have the, uh, let's say industrial space, having all sorts of robots and machines that uh, help us on the production lines and make uh, the work very efficiently. And last but not least, we have the mobility sector. Sure, we can uh, talk about planes and such, but one thing that is in the spotlight right now due to some major changes is the car. And those are so, so major that people are calling them true revolutions. And we can talk about, let's say, three pillars for these uh, uh, revolutions for the car. Uh, first of all, we can talk here about safety. That mostly means ADAS or advanced driver assistance systems. Basically, these are a set of features that prevent the, the number of car accidents and uh, maybe serious impacts. So in the end, this translates in preventing deaths and injuries. So th this is something that we all want. It has come to, let's say, a point where even the NCAP scoring tends to move its focus from rating the safety of the passengers within a car towards the, the safety of all the people. So this includes uh, other traffic participants, pedestrians, etc. Um, 
Another important uh, change would be in the electrification uh, side. This is a, a subject that is really widely covered by mass media in the, in the past years. And it's referring to the, to the electrical motor uh, taking the place of the internal combustion one. Um, here I have just some, some interesting predictions for 2030, but I'll make them uh, a little bit later. Um, coming back to the third, uh, let's say pillar, the third most important aspect um, would be this uh, data generation. In here, we, we have more and more data being generated by each car. And uh, there are a lot of interesting questions raised about, uh, let's say, what data needs to be consumed within the car, what data needs to be transferred in the cloud or to another car, so on and so forth. And if you were to, to look back, we can see that starting in the early 2000s and maybe up until 2010, um, it was about laptops, PCs and uh, gaming consoles revolution. Uh, starting from uh, 2010 to 2020, uh, we've had the, the smartphone, the data center and the cloud revolution. And right now, today, we're in the midst of this, uh, how should I put it, smart connected devices, smart homes and smart connected cars revolution. And um, why do I say this? Let's look at uh, some predictions that were made for uh, 2030. Um, we'll have more than 75 billion connected devices and around 60% of the cars will have an, an electrical motor. Um, more interesting is that uh, around 50% of the cars will be of level two assisted driving cars. What does this mean? So to simply put it, um, those are the cars that have internal systems that take care of uh, all, uh, <clears throat> all aspects of driving. It can be steering, acceleration, braking, so on and so forth. And uh, there is an asterisk here. The driver must be able uh, to intervene if any part of the system fails. So this level two is often referred to as the, the hands-off. Uh, level. And let me remember for, for the last prediction that uh, seems very interesting uh, for 2030, I want to mention that 60% of the world will have 5G coverage. And le let's move the, the discussion towards the, the automotive industry. Um, some interesting statistics here cover the, the number of processors per car. If we take a look in the early 2000s, we had around 10 processors per car in average. So we're not looking at the, the high-end cars, just an average of the industry. Um, we can see that in 2020, we had around 45. And this, uh, let's say, tends to grow to 60 in, in 2030. So in just two decades, we went from 10 processors to 45 in average. And one implication this has is on the lines of code that, that are written for, for those processors. And in the early 2000s, we had around 4K lines. And this spiked in, in 2020, somewhere between 100 and 200 millions. So again, in just 20 years, we went from 4K lines of code. So this is the software that's being uh, made for the car from 4K to 200 million. And uh, the trend says it will be between 500 million and 1 billion lines of code by, by 2030. So this is impressive, but uh, why is this important to NXP of all of the, the things I've mentioned? Well, all of it really mean one thing. It requires a lot of processing power and this makes NXP be the center of it all. And this is basically what NXP is already doing. So we are supporting all these kinds of applications, all these kinds of devices. And the, the question is, how do we do that? And how do we configure and, and use these applications to, to work with our hardware? 
um, how do we enable our customers to do it in a more modern way? Um, and by this, I mean both quickly and reliable, uh, because if you think about it at the end of the day, we are working with some complex processors and while quick is certainly good, uh, reliability is a must here. And we are providing our customers a, a lot of support. Um, <coughs> let's say we, we are providing, of course, a documentation. And because without it, we, we can't do really anything. Um, but these kind of reference manuals are often very big. They can range from a, a couple of thousand of pages and go over 10K for, for some. And it's very easy to understand why this does not make for, let's say, a, a scalable solution. And this is the, the main reason why we are providing additional software products like the real-time drivers, which make uh, configuring and using hardware very easy and straightforward. We are providing all sorts of uh, libraries, which are meant to help users let's say, uh, squeeze every drop of performance out of our hardware. And we are also providing these enablement tools. And last but not least, the, the reference design solutions. And I feel like I've, I've talked a lot, but it was, this was just to, to give a, a bit of context for the stuff I, I want to show next. Um, let's take a look at uh, this kind of typical application environment for someone who uses a, a processor from NXP. Here we, I took as an example uh, on IDOT MXRT uh, 1060 EVK, which is currently running a motor control application, as you can see depicted there. Uh, besides the hardware, let's take a look at the, the software behind it. So first of all, we, we can start with the ID or the integrated development environment. Um, Everyone, I guess, has used at some point or another something similar. Um, besides having the, the normal features an IDE has, you can find all sorts of interesting and uh, helpful integrated products integrated within. Um, first of all, it's an editor for code. So it will act like most editors you have used. Uh, it can highlight some issues with the code. It can indicate some warnings and possible solutions, uh, so on and so forth. You can keep all your code, your configurations, your binaries, and really whatever else you might need structured within a project that can be easily imported and exported. So uh, nothing new up until now. But next, you have integrated within it a debugger. And you, uh, this works as if you were debugging codes on the PC, uh, but it's actually communicating with the, with the embedded target processor. And here, um, I don't know, you can see the, the values of the variables you want to watch. You can see the registers of the processor. Uh, you can see the, the registers of the peripherals. Uh, you can see really the entire memory and what resides there. Uh, what else? You, you can use breakpoints, uh, jumps in and out of functions. Uh, really, you have all the, all the functions you might need to, to help debug your code. Um, but that is not all. That, that is just the, the ID. Now, I would like to, to talk about what we call the configuration tools. And let's make an uh, let's say this kind of mental exercise. Imagine you, you have some requirements for school or from employer and all the requirements for the system or the application are written simply on a piece of paper. If you only had, uh, let's say the, the reference manual and you needed to, I don't know, configure two pins, one clock and one peripheral, you would probably need to, to read and understand at least a hundred pages then go, write a considerable uh, number of lines of code, test everything to make sure uh, it runs at, as, as you expected it, and then just submit your work. Well, we want to, to help everyone to not go through all of that and provide the way 
just to translate the requirements from the piece of paper to this sort of graphical user interface. And this is basically what we are doing with the, with the configuration tools. Let's have a look. Um, first of all, this is what we call the PIMS tool. And um, as I said, uh, you have, let's say, a requirement to come and configure two pins to be you know, one output and one input. You just open the tool, you select whatever pin you want to, to configure, you mark it, and then you're done. It's really that simple. You, you, you get the information, you, you know what you are looking for, you come here and you select uh, the, the attributes that you needed. And if you wanna do something, if you want to set something that cannot be done, the tool will tell you exactly that. It will either warn you or outright throw an error depending on the, on the severity. And this is just another safety measure um, to take for reaching, uh, let's say this kind of good configuration or possible configuration. So there is no need to, to go through all the pages of the manual, just select it here. And if something is not right, the, the tool will tell you. Um, after everything uh, is done, so you've set it all up, uh, you don't get any kind of uh, warnings, the code just gets automatically generated for this configuration, as you can see on the, on the right side. And basically, you're done. That code is already verified to be working correctly, and you have nothing, nothing more to do on this side. But this was just, uh, let's say, the, the PIMS part. Um, now, let's take a look at the clock tool. Let's say here you wanted to, to select uh, this peripheral clock to be 75 megahertz. Without the tool, um, you would first need to, to understand the entire clock system really, and how it's all linked together. And to do this, you would need to, to invest a, a lot of time and patience. You will need to write manually some code and be careful not to do something wrong. Um, but this way, you, you can simply go and edit the peripheral clock root we have here uh, and put the value 75 megahertz and you're done. The UI even shows you on the schematic on the left, uh, the, the, clock, the clock tree, so you can see exactly what is happening behind the scenes. And in this case as well, if you try and put something that is not possible, uh, the tool would just throw an error and uh, indicate, let's say in this case, uh, you can see that the constraint says it must be lower or equal to 75 megahertz. But there is another thing you can do. You can use the tool. You don't even need to, uh, let's say, read the entire error or understand it. You can just right click and uh, use some, some feature like find near valid value that can uh, redo uh, the calculations automatically and set the, the possible nearest valid value to, to what you've set. And once you, you click on it, it will automatically change to, to that correct value. So again, just with a few clicks and without any, let's say, deep knowledge, deep uh, understanding requirement, you can set up uh, something very intricate like uh, the, the clock tree. Um, moving on, we have the, the peripheral tool. And let's say you, you wanted to configure UART to send some, some messages through the serial. Uh, you can even use some presets like this one with 115200 uh, N81. So um, if you select that preset, there you have it. It's, it's, you already have a function in configuration. If you want to do some tweaks and use, I don't know, some other board rate, just go and change the board rate. If you want to use a parity bit, just uh, go to the parity mode and select from uh, a drop-down list uh, how many parity bits you, you want to use. Um, here, you can see that the tools are interconnected. 
So uh, it displays that the Rx of the UART is not routed, the pin. So um, it warns you because uh, if you want to achieve your goal, you, you need to, to correct this. Otherwise, you just listen for a message that will never come. And you can simply, uh, let's say, go to the problem step here, just click on the, on the warning and it will uh, route you to, to the place that where you have to do something. In this case, it's again in the, in the pill, uh, pin tool um, tab. So once we, we get this figured out, so we want to, to use this pin as an Rx for UART, uh, we no longer have any warnings present, so we can go back and generate the code for the UART, and now we're done. So with just some simple clicks and a basic understanding of what we want to do, we can take the requirements from a piece of paper and translate it into this uh, graphical user interface and use it to generate the, the code that we need to, to configure everything, the, the pins, the clocks, the, the peripherals, everything. Okay, so up until now, we have covered the ID, the debugger and the configuration tools. So let's say we, we have achieved uh, working motor control application, and it is currently running on, on our board. So now what? Well, maybe we want to, to see some data from the board. I don't know, some current measurements, some speed measurements, uh, maybe even uh, tweak some parameters to uh, get a better performance of the, the, the controller. And luckily you can do all of this using Freemaster. So this is another tool that NXP is bringing, bringing to the table. One that is used for data visualization and this sort of parameter tuning. Um, let me open it. Okay. So as you can see, um, you can plot data using the, this oscilloscope function. You can even see the data as it's being transmitted to the application. Um, and that application is running on the PC. And uh, more importantly, you can even edit the parameters. In this case, maybe we want to manual, manually set the, the speed required uh, to see how the, the application does, it job, does its job. Um, we can see that the motor starts running, we can see the, the measured current values, et cetera. And another interesting feature um, is uh, what you see here in the, in the left, this variable stimulus. And this lets you program how a variable changes its value throughout the period of time. And this might, may come in handy for various testing scenarios because you, you can tell it, okay, so for five seconds, you keep the, the speed required at 500. For the next two seconds, you bump it up to 2K. I don't know, some scenarios that uh, are useful to, to you. Okay. Um, so now that, um, we saw that NXP can provide the hardware, the documentation, and a lot of software and tools. Um, and basically that's more than enough to, to get from, from idea to application. But um, this can be done using this kind of standard development flow, where you start off with designing your solution, making a prototype, going back if you see any issues, going into testing if everything is all right, and uh, going back to design if, if that fails. And this is an iterative process which you can uh, repeat until you, you reach the, the deployment phase. <coughs> now, let's see if we can uh, go even further than this. So going back to, to what we've got, 
up until now. We have the, the hardware, as I've said, the real-time drivers, the configuration tools, debugging tools, and uh, this kind of real-time monitor and uh, demo tools. But we want to use, as I said in, in the beginning, we want to use every resource that is at our disposal. Because if someone did some work, that means that we, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. And this is the case for, for MATLAB and Simulink. And there is an entire ecosystem building inside of it that can help speed up things even more. And first, let's take a look and, uh, and see what, uh, what it is. For those who are not familiar with the model-based design, uh, you can do a quick search. You can see it's a programming paradigm, uh, a visual method to be more exact. And you can imagine um, how you would write on a whiteboard a solution. And that's more or less what model-based design is. Um, it is very used in some industries like automotive and even aerospace. And I would like to, to talk about how you can get here uh, from, from idea to application. Um, we can take, again, as an example, the, the motor control application. So once we have the, the controller model, so uh, an algorithm that, that does this, this can be simulated on the host PC. And this is what we call model in the loop, and it's done 100% on the host PC. Um, then, we can, uh, let's say, take this code. Uh, we can take it a, a step further and generate C code for it. Uh, we can look and maybe optimize parts of it. All of this being still done just on the host PC. And this step is called software in the loop. And if we take it another step forward towards the, the processor in the loop, we can run the generated C code for the controller model directly on the embedded target while keeping the, the simulation for the electric motor on the host PC. And in this step, parameters will be passed between the host PC and the embedded target. So uh, we get the actual control algorithm run on the, on the target, on the hardware. But instead of spinning the, the physical motor, it just sends some data back and forth uh, between the, the embedded target and the PC. So you can do this if you are not very sure you're gonna, I don't know, uh, break something in, in your physical motor. Um, at the end, we can run the entire application on the target, having a real electric motor connected. And as you can see from idea to, to final application, at each of these steps, we had the benefit of using uh, simulation and figuring out what part of the entire model we want to put our focus on. So using this methodology, we can easily progress from let's say a, a pure simulation to having the entire application running on the target with everything in between. And this means we, we can do a lot of pre-work without even having the, the actual setup uh, ready for us to use. Um, I've said earlier that um, there is an entire ecosystem here, and I just want to, to, to give out some, some examples. Um, you can use uh, control design for tuning, auto-tuning, this sort of stuff. You can use Simscape for simulation of motors, transistors, diodes, whatever you, you might need. Um, you can use state flow for implementing finite state machines. Um, you can use various certification kits for, for different standards, so on and so forth. And this really means that you don't have to master a specific topic and you can still get the best performance out, out of it based on this ecosystem. Um, Okay, now you can see 
uh, this kind of new product that NXP does, and it's called Model Based Design Tools. You can see it as being a gateway between these two big ecosystems. So basically, we have in, in the lower part, NXP, with all those software products that, that we offer for, for our specific hardware. So everything that NXP does is hardware dependent, and it refers to, to NXP hardware. And on the other hand, we have Matworks with its rich and continuously growing toolboxes, all being hardware agnostic. And really, these model-based design uh, toolboxes from NXP acts like a glue from the hardware-specific tools and products to the uh, hardware agnostic ones. But let's take a look and, and see how, uh, how it looks like. And in the top part, you can see uh, what we call the configuration blocks. And in some older toolboxes, you can still find them. In others, in newer ones, uh, you can just use the, the configuration tools that I've talked about at the beginning. Um, basically, this is the place where you configure the system and uh, every peripheral that you want to use. Next, we have some, some blocks for inputs and outputs. And this can be uh, simple IOs, they can be uh, various peripherals, I don't know, for communication, PWM control, and stuff like that. Um, mm. The best part really is that here in the middle, there is an application algorithm. And this will always be hardware agnostic, so it can be moved from, from anything to anywhere. And this is where the, the ecosystem really comes in handy because you can use NXP blocks for, for inputs and outputs and have something totally uh, independent take care um, to, to solve your, your problems. Your problems meaning the, the algorithms. And um, you can have something for, for motor control, you can have, I don't know, some estimation for, for a state of charge uh, used for the, the battery management systems or really anything else. The, the main point is that it's hardware agnostic, so it doesn't need to, to be specific to a certain part and you, you can reuse it anywhere you, you need to. Um, having all of this in mind, um, you can see how the, the standard development flow uh, changes a bit. Now you can integrate uh, and test easily at each of, of these steps, be it at the, the design, the prototype, or, or the development one. And um, if you were to, to recap uh, why model-based design is popular for NXP customers, uh, I would say it provides a way to get fast time to market. It is very easy to use and reuse because of the, the ecosystems that I, I keep talking about. Um, you can simulate at each and every step of the way. Um, you can get all these kind of libraries that don't require uh, vast user experience uh, in that domain. You can just use what it's already uh, there, no need to reinvent the wheel. And last but not least, um, we, we, we link the two ecosystems, uh, which means that you can use both NXP products inside of Simulink and vice versa. So we unlock all the features from the two worlds and make them visible to users from both. Um, here, I, I want to, uh, let's say, take a quick look at a, a BMS demo and how you can achieve it with, with our tools without, without going into the, the nitty gritty details. As you can see, here we have a, a schematic for the, for the algorithm, if you may. Uh, we have the BMS ECU on, on the left and on the right, we have the, the plant uh, model for the battery. And below you can see the actual hardware. Well, on, on the left, you can see the ECU and on the right, just a, a battery emulator. 
<clears throat> in the top right corner, you can see the, the simulink model. And the best part about it is that the code can be automatically generated for the entire application just by, by pressing one button. And let me just enter here. So if you can see that there is this build button and once you press it, the code will start uh, to be generated. You, you see this uh, C files, this header file, so on and so forth. And after the compiling is done, the code can be downloaded to, to the board, to the actual hardware board. Um, once the, the code uh, gets generated and downloaded and the application uh, is running, you can use uh, this kind of free master interface. If you want to see, uh, I don't know, the, the cell voltages on, on each of them, if you want to see the, the pack current, so on and so forth. Um, so this is the, the normal free master, but you can even use what we call the free master light. And what is cool about free master light is that it can be run from anything that, that has a browser. So in some cases, it might be useful to, to use it from a phone for portability reasons, uh, maybe trying to, to debug something deployed on the field. And this can mean an issue already embedded in, in the car. And this way you can, you can see uh, various fault statuses and I don't know, other meaningful parameters without having to, to remove it completely from there. Um, just wanted to add here that every software product can be downloaded from the NXP site, which is simple nxp.com. And additionally, uh, the Simulink toolboxes that NXP provides can be also downloaded using the, the add-ons manager from, from Simulink. Um, if you wanna find out more details or, or have any questions, uh, you can, I don't know, contact me uh, directly via email. I will uh, leave it here. Or um, NXP has all these kind of communities that really act like a forum. You just ask there something and someone will, will come back with an answer. And uh, here you can see that the community closest to my heart, as this is the one I've been, let's say, most active throughout the years. Uh, so this is for the model-based design. Uh, we even have courses that, that you can follow and a lot of tutorials, workshops, stuff like this. And uh, I encourage you to, to take a look and see if you find something uh, of interest. And uh, I don't know, don't be shy and feel free to, to open a new thread or question uh, on these communities. Yeah, so uh, there you have it. Uh, a brief rundown of, uh, uh, let's say, what you have at your disposal from NXP, the hardware and a lot of software and tools to help you in various scenarios and hopefully make, make your life easier. And uh, don't forget to, to check our uh, site or communities if you want to find out more. So uh, I've been Razvan, uh, and uh, thank you for, for your attention. OK, thank you. Uh, thank you, Razvan, for uh, this uh, presentation. Uh, I think we will not have, you will not have time to answer to some questions, but uh, yes. Okay, so don't, don't, don't worry if there are any questions, you, you can feel free to, to send them. Uh, I don't know, I, I will send. Yes, you can, on, maybe you can or... send, the, yes, you can send the link on the chat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I'll put right now the, the link for the communities and the, the email if there are any questions, anytime uh, we're here to, to, to answer them. Okay, good. Uh, thank you again for uh, this nice presentation. Thank you as well. Hope that we can have you face-to-face uh, -face, uh, for the next editions uh, for the winter school. Uh, and as you said, students can uh, contact you if they, uh, they have questions by, uh, via your platform.
Sure. Okay, good. So uh, we come uh, to the end of uh, this winter school. Uh, thank you to all of you for uh, your attendance. Uh, and I hope that you uh, you enjoyed this uh, this winter school. Uh, and good luck for the for the next semesters. Uh, 